So, welcome everybody back to the workshop for, for the uh, fall semester. I want to thank the committee which organized the workshop for this year, Tom Evans, uh, Claudia, um, uh, David Kaniski, who's not here, and Scott, who's not here, and myself. Um, so thanks to everybody. And today we have David Stadelman, who's visiting us from the uh, University of Bayreuth in Germany. And he knows the rules. We discussed this over tequila last night. Fully aware of all the, <laughs> all the rules. So you have five minutes, and then we'll, and I'll keep track of the queue and so on. <laughs> so thank you very much. It's a true pleasure for me to be here, uh, and it's a true pleasure to present this uh, work in progress. So it's really work in progress, and I'm looking really uh, to your input. Uh, so hopefully, we'll get a lot better this evening than it currently is. Uh, let me just explain a few of the things uh, that we want to do and that, that we want to establish with this. So the title is currently also only provisionary. Uh, it's currently no, no. It's what we are interested in. So we want to know whether politicians change their, their behavior once in office, and if this change in behavior corresponds to public expectations. So in the end, what we are interested in is something which is not completely economic, but well, mixing different fields. We are interested in whether there we can observe something like the power of the office. So the office itself changing the person or the behavior of the person. Uh, and we think we have a relatively nice uh, <coughs> data setting to do that. And I will quickly explain uh, that data setting. So what we want to see is whether politicians change their behavior towards the preferences of uh, their constituents once changing from one house of parliament to another house of parliament. And we look at the situation in Switzerland. So I, I speak in pictures now, okay? I use photos, that's the easiest thing. This is the Houses of Parliament. And Switzerland's constitution is modeled uh, relatively similar to uh, that of the United States. Actually, it wasn't inspired by the United States Constitution. It has two houses, uh, an upper and a lower house, call it Senate uh, and, uh, uh, and, uh, and uh, yeah, House of Representatives. Uh, and the prerequisites to be elected the power of the houses, etc. That's all identical. There are a few minor differences between the houses. One is that uh, politicians, MPs of the upper house, are elected in the majoritarian system, whereas MPs from the lower house are elected under proportional rule. Plus, the two houses are not of equal size. The upper house is a bit smaller. The post is also a bit more prestigious of uh, being an upper house politician. Okay, and these politicians decide on precisely the same. Uh, Subjects precisely the same legislative proposals. Okay. Now, this can be observed, of course, politicians' decisions can be observed in numerous countries. The special situation, I think, that we have uh, in Switzerland is that we also know precisely what voters wanted regarding specific <coughs> legislative proposals, at least for a selection of them. Okay. Why do we know that? Well, because uh, we look at referenda. Uh, so you know Switzerland is the direct democracy in the world, and you see people here voting. Uh, in this case, it's a cantonal referendum holding up their hands, really. So on proposals that politicians decide on in parliament, not everything is enacted immediately. All constitutional proposals must pass also a referendum. And in this referendum, we observe the will of constituents. Now, the upper house and the lower house politicians are representing precisely the same constituencies. Okay? And what we then observe, or what we then look at, is we look at people, at politicians, who have served in the lower house, okay? and they are then elected by their constituents to the upper house. So they change houses. Okay? And then we look at <coughs> these politicians, we have 37 of them, whether they change also their behavior regarding how they fulfill the preferences of their constituents. Okay? So we observe politicians first in the lower house, then the same politicians, the same persons in the upper house who are elected to the upper house, and then econometrically, statistically, we continue to compare these politicians who changed houses uh, to their former colleagues who remain in the lower house. What do we observe? A quick answer to results. We observe that politicians in the upper house tend to be more congruent with the preferences of their 
constituents than in the lower house. That is what you would expect uh, from them in the upper house. You also observe that once they are in the low, no, when they are in the lower house, they are just like normal politicians from the lower house. However, when they change to the upper house, they are just like normal politicians from the upper house. But you see that upper house politicians represent their constituents better than lower house politicians. Thus, there has been a behavioral change, and we can uh, identify this behavioral change econometrically to uh, doing something like a difference in difference estimation. We then interpret that as evidence, we interpret that as being consistent with what we like to name, like to call uh, a Thomas A. Beckett effect, referring uh, to uh, Thomas A. to the Archbishop Thomas A. Beckett uh, of Canterbury, who changed his behavior, first being a Lord Chancellor, siding with King Henry II against Pope Alexander III, and then becoming an Archbishop, and suddenly became a man of the church, so his beliefs, his behavior changed completely, and he even got killed for that. That's why he's a saint. Thanks. I'm looking forward to you. <laughs> yeah, very, good on the, very good at time. I'll take the queue, so let me know if you'd like to be on the queue. So he is on the queue. Okay, yeah. um, so, you know, nice. I, I really like this. Um, as, as a further test, do, do we have, in other words, you get, you get elected, you move from the lower to the upper house, but that doesn't happen on a Friday and then on Monday you're in the upper house, right? Mm -hmm. So can you observe their votes in what would be considered the lame duck period between moving? And do they, do they still vote like the lower house? while they're there, even though they've been elected to the upper house? Mm -hmm. uh, no. We and then how would would interpret that? Okay. Unfortunately, we can't observe that. So the change takes place relatively quickly once you are elected. That's always uh, at, at the end of October, yep. so in October. And then in the next session already, the house constitutes. Uh, and. If there is a delay, then we don't have any referenda in between where we could observe uh, how they react towards their constituents. Well, even if you didn't have the referenda, you could nevertheless see if they vote more similarly to other members of. Do they, while they're in the lower house, do they still vote as if they're in the lower house? Yeah. Okay. Or do they vote for their future house where they've now been elected? This we can do. Uh, and this we have partly done. So we observe that uh, we observe no time difference in that sense. So once they are still in the lower house, uh, shortly prior to the election, they behave as if they are members of the lower house. And once they change to the upper house, they change more or less immediately also their behavior, meaning they behave then also as if they are members of the upper, if they had always been members of the upper. So in that sense, there is an immediate jump. I'm not sure I followed that. What's the immediate jump? You get, so you get elected on October mm -hmm. whatever, 30th. And then there's some more votes between then and the next time when everybody okay. switches. Uh, and, and then there's also lame ducks, people in the upper house and presumably the lower house who, who, who in the upper house they lost the election? Do they change their votes as well? Because mm -hmm. okay. there's a literature in the U.S. Yeah. about how lame duck uh, congressmen vote, mm -hmm. and it goes back to an article by Keith Pool in the '90s uh, about congressmen uh, dying with their ideological boots on. I think is the title. Meaning, even when they're out of office, they, th their ideology remains consistent, mm -hmm. even if they're a lame duck. So, again, for the timing between, uh, we don't observe them. Yeah. So, okay. Uh, for this type of lame, so this type of lame duck, we don't observe. So we only observe them prior to the election when they are still in the lower house. Yeah. Okay. 
also in terms of time relatively close to the election, we can observe them. And we yeah, only I, observe yeah. them afterwards, right. after the election, yeah, in the upper so not in between the yeah, yeah. unfortunately. Okay, uh, Gustavo is next. Yeah. You were first. <laughs> Actually, I was first, but I bumped you. myself back. <laughs> so I think you should go. <laughs> okay. So um, I was thinking, well, I've I already seen this presentation a couple of times, so as I'm, I'm going to, to jump to uh, kind of an analogy that I was thinking. It's uh, what about, um, uh, for example, lawyers? No? So it's, uh, it's maybe you're representing a client uh, with some particular position. You've, well, in that case, you have a legal obligation to represent the client. Then maybe in another case, you are exactly on the other side of this situation, and you are kind of legally uh, also uh, obliged to represent maybe the opposite position. No? So is it possible that these uh, representatives are seeing uh, that something like that is going on? So essentially, my role is to represent. Okay? Uh, um, I know that it's very difficult to disentangle do things empirically, but I was thinking if that's possible, and then maybe that opened the door to know, another empirical application in a, dif a very different environment. No? But I understand the differences. It's in one case, you are kind of legally tied to do something, yeah. but still I think you have some margins where you can, I don't know, you can put a lot of effort or not much effort, things like that, and in this case, you are not legally tied to represent the preferences. So you have exactly, you're not legally tied. The Constitution would stipulate that uh, as a member of the lower house, you should represent uh, the nation, not your constituency. Whereas as a member of the upper house, you should represent your constituency. Uh, we try to do some tests uh, on that. And it seems that once you become a, an upper house politician, you tend to represent the nation and the constituency better, but the constituency even better than the nation. So that's, in this sense, consistent that you fulfill your legal obligation, although uh, nobody can force you to do so. So it's role play, yeah. Could, uh, could you explain what is the that? source of hold the on, Hold on, here. Because I didn't know. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, it's a of 27. So the source well, okay, but well, everybody can't follow up at once. Yeah, so so the sor this is just the interpretation of the constitutional article, what representatives of the lower house and the upper house should do. So the constitution says that uh, lower house politicians are representatives of the people, implying of the nation as a whole, whereas upper house representatives are representatives of the states, that's of the constituency of the land. So uh, this would be the interpretation. Okay. Of the cantons. Of the cantons. Okay. The constituencies are the cantons. But lower and upper house politicians are elected in the cantons only. On this point, go ahead. Yeah, on this point, I still don't understand how you can represent in proportional voting some elected by the Green Party. Mm -hmm. I'm beholden to these, you know, environmentalists that you know, hey, I got to do what they want. I thought, but then you're telling me, no, I also have to serve the nation. So I'm, I'm a little, I don't quite. You would have almost thought it'd be the flip if you've got proportional voting. Aren't the people who elected you, you know, skewed in a way, right? Because they're evangelicals, they're environmentalists, they're whatever they can be. Uh, be clowns in Italy, um, but only in Italy. <laughs> but I, so I, I'm a little bit, you know, confused as to, as to as to the you know I'd be irritated if I'm. You know, invite, elect an environmental guy, and then he's serving what you say is the nation's interests. When I want him to be making yeah. sure you don't, you know. I think that's part of the story. What you are referring to, so maybe it's just me. I don't understand. You know, if you have proportion. No, no. I, I think you are right. So you are you are elected in the canton, and if right. it's on the 
proportional rule, you would think that you are representing a certain section of uh, right. population yeah, in, yeah, yeah. in your case, which explains also why average congruence levels are lower for uh, politicians in the lower house, because what mm -hmm. we are looking yeah. at is how do you represent the majority of your canton of your constituency. Oh, okay. oh okay. That's, that's okay. okay, that's different. That's, yeah. So, in the nation. In a sense, we are compare, we are looking at the, a majoritarian concept of representation also for proportional politicians. Right. Oh, but from the canton. From the canton, right. yes, okay. exactly. Uh, and I mean, this partly induces the lower congruence level because you would expect I'm mm -hmm. focusing uh, uh, on mar partly marginal groups. Right. Okay? <coughs> of course, there are numerous different dimensions in politics. But uh, nevertheless, so all what you are saying actually goes against finding any effect because uh, you would think you stay nevertheless with your clients. Uh, right. But you, you observe this change, and well, we would interpret it as this uh, Samuel, but uh, Thomas A. Beckett effect. Uh, yeah. Because no, the, the, the incentive is not aligned with so normal. Electoral incentive is not aligned with what we observe. Okay, we have uh, Claudia next. presidential ones or with the gubernatorial ones or with the local elections, mm -hmm. we see that actually those tend to, politicians tend to behave different when the elections are concurrent. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, because that could be the effect is related to the total mm -hmm. roles and not actually just a changing from one mm -hmm. the house to the other. Okay, let me quickly answer that directly with the concurrent elections. No, there are no concurrent elections, neither are there concurrent referenda. So it's a, a highly organized society, of course. Uh, since, 18, since 1851, uh, the elections always take place uh, on a Sunday in October. And there are, so usually in Switzerland you vote four times a year at the national level in uh, referendum, okay? Mm -hmm. But in the election year, there are only three periods where you vote in referenda because the fourth is reserved precisely for uh, for the election. And then at the date of election, there are no other cantonal, uh, uh, cantonal elections or other cantonal referenda going on. So uh, this, this is not the case. So then so there shouldn't be a problem there. Regarding district magnitude, yes, district magnitude varies for the lower house between the different constituent, uh, constituencies. It goes from uh, single member districts, there are six single member districts, where you are elected in the proportional system, then with a plurality of votes, simply, to uh, 34, uh, to 34 members. So uh, there is if you want a certain proportionality uh, over different districts. Now, when we try to assess, uh, try to assess this uh, Thomas A. Beckett effect, we also take account of that, uh, partly by excluding these single member districts, uh, partly by controlling, partly by controlling for it. But uh, there is, yes, there is diversity in the way uh, the proportional system is made by <coughs> regarding the number of uh, the number of seats, perhaps this can be explored even uh, even further. Okay, we have. Uh, see, I can't read my own uh, handwriting here. Mm -hmm. Who could it be? Not Barbara. Oh, no, it's, uh, 
Federico. Who builds it? Still is in the queue, but Federico is first. No, it's just Bill that comes through. I want to go back to the to the uh, point that both Barb and, and Lee uh, were raising earlier about the, um, the, the voting system and how that uh, shifts our understanding of constituency, but also how the understanding of constituency like maps onto what you call the like public expectations and public interest. Because it seems to me, and this is not a criticism, it's just a request for a greater kind of like a texture, I think. Um, the the constituency of a plurality, of a, of a proportional system, of, of, a, of a candidate selected with a proportional system is different than a constituency of a candidate selected with a majority system, which is different from the majority uh, uh, preference of a, of a population that votes through a referendum, which is different from the national interest. And so I think that, like, I, I love the paper. I think that the, the Swiss system like, gives you, like, really a really nice, like, natural laboratory to answer this question, um, which is obviously very important. But I think that if, uh, I think that, like, I would like to see a little bit more time spent on, like, defining the different, like, how, you, like, you seem to assume that there are constituencies, and the constituencies lead in the, in the, in the aggregate to a public, uh, um, to public expectations, but I'm not sure that I see how this works in the context of a, such a complex uh, set of electoral rules. Mm -hmm. That's a very good comment. So we define constituency here as purely the geographical constituency, right. of course, but uh, right. not this in terms of population, etc. Right. Uh, and when we talk about nation, we mean the majority decision in the nation. But right. yes, uh, yeah. that we have to be Bill, finally. <laughs> um, I, like, like others, I've really enjoyed this paper and, and what you've done with uh, this, the opportunity the Swiss system presents. And, I, I, uh, and it made me think, as I read through it, that the pattern in your data seems to me to be most closely aligned with a sociological explanation, which is that individual human behavior is highly plastic and people take on organizational roles. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so I want to pose the question to you this way. It seems to me as though we have um, a room full here of institutional economists and political science, mm -hmm. with a few exceptions, but myself included, who are working awfully darn hard to find an explanation for this that goes through incentives and preferences and, and, and calculations and institutional effects and all of that stuff. And the most parsimonious explanation for the pattern in your data is from sociology. Yeah. You, put, you take the same person, you put them in a different organization that has different roles and expectations they behave for. Exactly. Why isn't that the finding? Well, I'm, I'm just... I, want, I have to come on a point on that. Would you Econ is all about that. You just change the price. The same person does stuff different. I don't know what the. I don't know why you're calling this a sociological explanation. I mean, econ is all about what's same people what's do different stuff. Of, what's different. the price difference here? Well, I don't. And, that's and, the. And in that's what a, way is it anything different well, that's a big, from what a sociologist that's a big, would call a role difference? That's a big question of what exactly the incentives are. I think it's kind of fuzzy. But the idea that econ has these molded people that. Do, same thing no matter what. That's a, that's a complete mischaracterization of our model. <laughs> well, I, I threw the political scientists on the bus too. I think, I mean, to some extent, it's, pre no, it's precisely what you're saying, and that's, I mean, it's a parsimonious explanation. We don't need to call it Thomas Beckett effect. So people well, like take it. different roles. That's why we try to eliminate the select, so the selection effect, and that's why we try to eliminate standard economic and political science incentive effects. And what you're left with is and what you are, people that's, change. <laughs> exactly, that's, people change based on what they're supposed to do. But that would be, actually, that would be the story I would want to forward if you think it's an interesting story. Well, I, I think it's an interesting story to let the sociologists be right for once. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't think it's a either. <laughs> It's an organizational, the electoral incentives are now for you to vote like the upper house. 
You want on this point, Barbara? Can, can I get it on? It's all point? related, but uh, yeah. Well, let, let, well, Barbara race. on this point, then Gerhard on this point. Nick was going to be on a point earlier. Well, Nick is Nick is on the main queue, and Barbara's after him. Do you want to <laughs> wait till you're? I'll wait the main queue. Gerhard then on on this point. It seems to me that the incentives to pass votes depend upon the system that's used. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's probably not the price like the price of a six pack, but the incentive in one system of election you have one incentive. To your ideological position, and then another system, you have an incentive to get closer to the median. If it's not a median or a model, that's that's economics. But I, I'm not sure if that work can distinguish those two approaches: uh, economic approach on the one hand, or the sociological. On this point, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, but I have a question. If it, and maybe I misunderstood the the data in your data. Upper House MPs behaved this way whether they sought re-election or not, right? Exactly, yeah, so it's not... So it's not like it's I've not got an incentive to align with my constituents because I want to stay in the Upper House. As soon as I go in the Upper House, I start behaving differently whether I seek re-election or not. Exactly, that would be what uh, we so have as evidence. it's hard for me to get out an incentive-based yeah. explanation here. So we what don't find the incentive any to do what? Exactly. We okay, don't Jimmy on this um, point. <laughs> so just because you don't seek re-election doesn't mean you don't have incentives to be the same incentives possibly. We know this happens in the U.S. all the time. If you align with all this money you can make after getting out, after not being elected. But I guess one thing I was you've only got 37 individuals. Isn't there some ability to talk about different prices that they face? That some individuals face a higher price than others for not following their constituents. Mm -hmm. And that seems to me that would that would help. Okay, what we suggest other things, but again, you only get thirty-seven. But, but in other words, you have some individuals that look like they're totally ignoring their decisions when they move, when they move, and they like that. Okay, Nick. Finally, I mean, this was kind of onto this. Uh, you know, I, I come from George Mason, where we're you can't an alternate through politics as exchange. So, what is the institution going on at these houses? What are the what are the you know, formal and informal rules that are happening here that are constraining them the way they do? Right? Uh, even in the paper, you say it's not about you know when you get in the office, it's not about seeking re-election that is constraining them. So, what is constraining? Them? What's the feedback mechanism that's happening where they, if they behave badly, they're punished for it? Because there clearly are something like that has to be going on. So I think it's a really a micro story where you need to explain what is going on at, at the ground level in these houses that are leading to the exchanges between the different individuals, between the constituents and the, the, the actors, and then between the politicians with different constituents. What's the, the compromises, what's the exchanges going on uh, that are helping to lead to why this is a good institution? You know, these are good institutional rules that are getting them to behave the way they should. Right? It's not surprising to me that they behave the way the office says. What's cool about this is that the office does what it's supposed to do. <laughs> right? It's getting it so that they behave for their constituency. That seems the rarer thing to me. Right? It's he's, they're still self-interested. Uh, it's I'm not sure it's the like, sociological. It is. What's going on? What are the rules that are getting them so that they're aligning their self-interest with the social interest? And that, that you need to really get down to what's going on at the You want to respond or go to the next question? So that's actually, I think, what we precisely try to do, and we can't come up with any clear explanation apart from that people take their organizational roles so that they fulfill the expectations. I mean, that's perhaps that's not clear yet uh, fully in the paper. I mean, it can't it can't be selection. So it's not voters selecting specific people, specific politicians, uh, who they think will uh, will adapt or represent them relatively well, because we observe that the person changes. Thus, it must be, if you are uh, in economics, it must be uh, an incentive explanation. But for all the standard incentives that we have, election and re-election uh, constraints mainly, we don't find anything. We don't find anything that people getting older would behave uh, worse towards their constituents. So, the only thing that seems to remain is this uh, organizational role. 
Uh, you need to do it. So I guess my question is, is the why? Why is that going on? Was still very unclear. Yeah, that actually did come across, but it's still not that question. Yeah. Why? But it's when you talk to these, when you, when, you, when you talk to these politicians, they say now, now that, so now that's my task. So I was elected to now represent my canton. I'm more independent from my party because I'm directly elected. That's also what we observe. I mean, that's uh, an incentive. The party control mm. is not so uh, it's not so hard anymore. But they see themselves as in their role of upper house representatives. And they are old, I mean, they may make, they are relatively rich already, okay? They have, uh, they have You're business. rich enough. Not rich enough, of course, <laughs> never, never ever rich enough. Uh, but the, the, so they tend to, well, most politicians tend to be that old. That explains why it works, by the way. <laughs> uh, tend to be old, so. I think it's not a story of going afterwards and getting speaking fees, etc. So that's a bit less common uh, in our setting than it would be uh, for U.S. Congress or uh, for presidents. They actually reduce their ties to interest groups, don't they? They reduce their ties to interest groups. It may be that they focus on the important ones. That we don't know, of course. But they reduce the number, so not significantly, but they reduce the number of ties to interest groups. Besides, yeah. Just, but the, but so are there anomalies, though? You got 37 people. Can you at least find some that they just look like? I would have. Uh, there, I would have to dig. Yeah. Yeah. It might be uh, interesting to figure yeah. out who those are. Okay. That may yeah. be where the that's the real information is. Yep. Yeah. That's finding Barbara. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I found. I think the results are really interesting, but I found myself not feeling like there was enough development of, like you say, following expectations. We talked about uh, what is the source of the expectations, yeah. say the Constitution. Well, I would include what are the provisions of the Constitution, so people know what they, they are. Um, the other thing I mm -hmm. think is, I think you need to explain more the machinery behind how the election works. Mm -hmm. um, how many people are on the ballot? How do you become on a ballot? Are you on a ballot? Are you actually representing a party? Are you running when it's done plural? Plur actually representing directly your district plurality, is it clear which person on the ballot is falling into which thing? I mean, you actually have to get more into the machinery to understand how people run. How expensive is it to run? Mm -hmm. The reason why we get, and I think it's picking up some of the other comments, if they're able to follow more what this intent is in the country, it's because some things are present or not present. And this is where looking at other countries might help stimulate questions. For example, a lot has changed in the United States when the Republicans and the Democrats actually changed their party <coughs> rules. The way they changed their party rules, for example, in the nomination for president, it used to be you didn't, never even selected, there was no primary system. You, you, you didn't know who was going to be nominated for president until the, 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 the convention appeared itself. The cost of running for office now is so great that that's why um, a lot of the politicians in the United States have to get money from a lot of different sources, or you have to be independently wealthy. Um, what does it cost to run for these offices? I have no feel for that at all, and whether or not, what yeah. mechanisms are or are not in place that either better enables them to not be diverted from their party, or what other forces might be into play. There could be other additional social norms. Mm -hmm. You know, you're a smaller, relatively speaking, uh, smaller mm -hmm. nation, but You still have the German speaking, the French speaking. I'm just curious, is there any demographic difference? Yeah. Um, I find myself wanting to understand more the machinery behind. Are these, and what I also find really interesting is it appears there's no staggered terms here. They all are elected in both houses at the same yeah. time. Well, that's also something to consider because it might be different if you were in a place where you had offices and they were staggered. Yeah. But when you re when you reelect both houses at the same time in totality, that's yet a different game, so to speak. So I found myself wanting to know more about how what really <coughs> is it like running for office, and what other dynamics could come into play. Because when you have a constitution like our U.S. Constitution, there's our constitution didn't even speak to parties. Parties use the rules later. Parties develop their own rules. Then parties change rules, and all this stuff. Changes. What happens with, uh, I'm wondering, even the role of the press? 
when people run for office, um, how do people get their information? Are they required? Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I don't know what the equivalent of free speech or free press might be there. Uh, we used to have something in the United States called the Fairness Doctrine. When you had broadcasting and a certain viewpoint was presented, airtime had to be made available for the other viewpoint. And ever since they've gotten rid of the Fairness Doctrine, that's what's enabled a lot of these, the growth of a lot of these uh, networks and things that can just represent one viewpoint. And that's been viewed by a lot of people, people who studied this in the media school and political science, I'm sure, as well, is how that's changed voting behavior. Now people can um, just tune in to one voice. Mm -hmm. I mean, I don't have any feel for any of this dynamic. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yes, I see what So I see too. how on the global, like on the macro thing, you're saying there's this pattern, but to really better understand mm -hmm. why. In, in this case, it may be, what is it about Switzerland that better enables the behavior to be in line with, with Constitution, okay. well, intention was compared to all these other countries where no matter what was in the Constitution, there's so many other layers that come into play that it's widely deviated. I mean, certainly the dysfunctionality that's in Congress right now is not what was intended. <laughs> but that's due a lot to the party behavior and party lines and how parties have changed. So it's just kind of interesting, I don't, but I don't have a feel for how it plays out there. So maybe further yeah. enriching that discussion it's and maybe even looking to that might reveal some things yep. that Jim thought of. It should be done, yeah. Oh, yeah. We'll be next, Nabila, after that. Okay, well, this is, I mean, you've got 28,000 observations, so whenever you have that, you're going to find something statistically significant, it seems to me. And th this is kind of Lee's general comment about econometrics is before we go with all these yeah. fixed effects and everything, yeah. It's a bit like Barb's point. Don't think about econometrics as a test, but think yep. about it as an analytical tool. Mm -hmm. So, and if you get rid of the fixed effects and just run things and do German cantons vote differently than French cantons, do people more senior vote different than junior people, which is a, a we find in most cases you can vote your ideological preferences more the more senior you are because your electoral chances of getting reelected are much higher. So I think this is an incredibly rich data set. And table one tests sort of the main point you want to have, but it, it all leaves a lot of us with saying, like, Jimmy, are there outliers? Yep. Are the Germans different than the French? Do older people vote differently than younger people? Mm -hmm. And it sounds like no one ever goes from the upper house back to the lower house. Nobody goes back. No, no nobody goes back. Um, it's only upwards. Yeah, that's well, that's, <laughs> I don't know if anybody's ever gone from the Senate back to the House. I don't know. Let the president go back to the House. Yes, yes, <laughs> a, a president back to the House. Um, no, it's more from House to Senate. No, I'm, I'm, no, I'm saying to your point, is that yeah. what you're saying? But, but, so I think there is yeah. a lot of richness here that may well be another paper. Yes. Yeah. You're trying to nail this one down. But I think, and then I, I, I liked your analogies that you don't fully develop, like when you get elected, or when you get appointed, rather, to the Federal Reserve, you know, central bankers behave uh, differently than you might anticipate. Mm -hmm. Supreme Court justices behave quite a bit differently ex post than people expected ex ante. Um, so I think this, and this Bill's point really is in a really fascinating one, maybe a different paper, is how the position changes, changes the, I'm now, I now have a, a different role yep. than I did before. And, and I think that's a really uh, fascinating uh, question. Again, it could be a, another paper and a more Maybe difficult one, but it's. Uh, I, I think we have other instances where this occurs. Less likely in politics because of these electoral incentives, but people who are appointed, it's maybe even more startling that without the electoral incentives, they nevertheless change what you would expect them to do. Would you see that paper already as evidence for this different understanding of roles? Yeah, I mean, I think it moves in that. It certainly moves in that direction. Um, 
Yeah, it, that that part would just like Bill's point just needs to be flushed out more. I think about um, are there term be, limits or no? The equivalent of any term no, limits? No, there are no term limits. So it's and and even pointing things out like that. I mean, because yeah. different yeah. machinery yeah. can guide different incentives. So making yeah. clear to the reader. Is there mandatory retirement? Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> no. No mandatory retirement. No. Nabila, isn't it? organizational role essentially and it, it looks at how those things shape behavior um, kind of differently and I feel like that might be a really nice piece of literature to tie mm -hmm. into the mm -hmm. paper because yep. it really fits um, with the findings thank you what yeah. time yep so uh, I was very interested by your measure of congruence with uh, the constituency, and I want, wondered if you could talk a little more about this. Um, the reason is that I don't know much about referendum in Switzerland, mm -hmm. uh, but I imagine they are more frequent than in most Western countries. Mm -hmm. uh, but like, what kind of issues do these referendum like, concern mm -hmm. in general? Like, right. Because it's possible that these referenda actually are always on questions that are very, you know, splitting issues, such as, you know, should we, should we like take the military out of Switzerland, or should we not have a military or something? That's the, I mean, or should we build minarets yeah. or things like this? There are controversial issues, and there are less controversial mm. issues. <laughs> yes, yeah. So but I was the, wondering to uh, what extent this referendum represents a constituency political interest because mm -hmm. there might be on some issues that are very, you know, much mediatic, right, to some extent. Mm -hmm. And um, another side question about this is that, so if your politicians, once they get elected to the upper house, seem to be representing more of the constituency, isn't that also an effect of the bottleneck effect between the lower house to the upper house? So the people mm -hmm. actually getting to the upper house are the ones who would be more consensual and then you know more aligning with the constituency naturally. Yeah. Uh, so in the lower house, you would have more diversity of representing the constituency because there are more people, more uh, sensitivities. But then once you get into the upper house, uh, the politicians who get into the upper house are actually those politicians that you know are more aligned with the system or the constituency in general. In a way, the consensual politicians <coughs> tend to move to the upper house as opposed to the other ones. Okay, very interesting. So uh, the topics are very broad. Some are uh, controversial, like say building minarets. Although that was not so controversial in a sense because over sixty percent of people agreed. You know, uh, it's on business taxation. It's whether you want to have a postal service also in the countries. Uh, it's part uh, on abortion. So not abolishing abortion or not, but prolonging uh, uh, the delays uh, when, you can, when you can abort. So it's really broad uh, societal issues. Some, uh, some potential stupid questions too, you know. Uh, do you want to get rid of the Swiss military? Well, I don't know if it's a stupid question. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> can, some would see it as a stupid question, but that, I don't know. I don't think it's the bottleneck, but they have to, we have to make it clearer. So at the very least, again, uh, at the time you observe the politicians in the lower house, where they are still in the lower house, they are not different uh, than uh, other lower house politicians. So it's not, perhaps they are the people who are more consensual, yes, but it's difficult for voters to identify that because... Uh, is the only way to get to the upper house to be in the in the lower no. house? So you you can you can easily rule that out yeah. by just looking at exactly. people that get there in different ways. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. That's just, just a quick follow up. Is there are there any other data sets that you could add to this, such as opinion polls? Yes. Or there are. That, to which you could compare. You know, because 
I think congruency with the constituency just based on referendum is a very, I mean, robust measure. But could it be complemented by other measures that try that might confirm your results or contradict mm -hmm. them? Uh, I think I, I think we will like help address some of the criticism that uh, <coughs> the re referendum measure might actually not represent really well the mm -hmm. all that uh, the MPs are voting on. That's true. So there are survey measures too, uh, but mostly actually survey measures related to the referendum. Uh, then again, of course, so this is a selection of issues which makes it to a referendum. Uh, you can have, so all constitutional issues, which are approximately 25% of the data, they uh, are mandatory. So there is always a referendum on that. All initiatives, there a referendum is mandatory. And then for, there are, for any law, it can happen that a referendum emerges if uh, 50,000 signatures are collected. It's approximately 1% uh, of the population. So it's a very low threshold in a sense. So the referendum threat is real. And if a party wants uh, to have a referendum on something, then they usually can manage it. Okay, I'm on the queue now. Uh, so I, I really think uh, the paper is mostly about uh, when you have congruence between, that's the basics, uh, when you have congruence between the political mm -hmm. uh, the preferences of the voters and the and actions of the politicians. And you, and you kind of focus only on this upper lower house thing without really, really giving us, I think, the full theory of why they would be different. I think you need to work there. But you also don't discuss any other things that might lead to congruence, and I'm guessing there are. And I'm wondering why you don't do that. And in the empirical work, I know you have a bunch of uh, control variables, but you don't really show them. But, um, what other, I mean, other things might make it more or less costly to be in congruence with your, with your um, voters. And so there could be, and I'm guessing there are, other things going on besides just this upper lower house story. Yeah. A, little, a little bit of what Martin was getting at and, and others as well. So I guess I'm asking you why you didn't go that direction, or maybe you did a little bit, and you could comment on some things you found. Uh, of, co of course we did, so we looked at different personal characteristics too when exploring congruence. This is how it, now in the setting it's held automatically constant by the individual fixed facts. So it's not personal characteristics, in that sense, unless personal characteristics that change all the time, which would be age, time in office, and if you consider the personal characteristic, uh, the number of interest groups. Uh, so the number of interest groups you have partly affects congruence. Okay. Uh, we can and how? How does it? Um, <laughs> so on average, positively, which is mainly because uh, members from uh, center parties they tend to have more uh, more um, interest groups too, but members from centre parties at the same time are also more congruent with the majority of the population. We also control, but uh, uh, for for parties, so you observe that <coughs> members of left wing and right wing parties have lower levels of congruence. But again, this is controlled for once you introduce the fixed effects. Uh, so there are not many variables left. Uh, which, which are not captured by uh, which are not captured by the fixed effect, unless they are institutional. But the main institutional difference is, uh, is when, in which house you are. The Canton, even so, all which is, uh, all which is specific to your constituency. Okay, so the voters there are uh, the language uh, that's spoken, etc. That's also individual specific. Uh, so at least it's kept. That's why we don't have a lot of other things here to tell. Yeah. But uh, so you guys are both on point, it sounds like. Yeah, it's related yeah. to that. Well, yeah. Go ahead, Bill, okay. then, Barbara. Well, it's just what I found interesting is I literally just Googled mm -hmm. the Federal Assembly, and there was an interesting sentence that caught my eye here. And I think this is part of getting to that cultural norm. Mm -hmm. It says the Federal Assembly is, in keeping with the Swiss militia concept of community service, mm -hmm. a semi-professional parliament. 
This means that most deputies have another job mm -hmm. in addition to their parliamentary duties to which they devote an average mm -hmm. of 60% of their working hours. I think this is important. They don't view yeah. this as their full-time job, whereas a lot of most politicians on nations, it's their full-time job. And also you said this, in keeping with this tradition of Swiss militia concept, it almost sounds like I think you need to explore to what extent the culture might be such. You know, like when people think of going into the military or something, it sounds like there might be some kind of historical legacy or grounding of this that's sort of like, like you say, I get this concept like, well, it's a form of community service. It's like you're supposed to do, you know what I'm saying? There might be something about the culture that leads people to view how they conduct this role differently from countries who don't view yes, exactly. politicians that's or their offices that, may well that way. Be the case. That may well be the case, but uh, it's uh, a, militia, a militia parliament for the upper and the lower house, and you still observe the change when the people by politicians change from the upper to the lower house. Plus, there are some, uh, call them professional politicians, and even for those professional politicians, you don't observe that they react more to election incentives than uh, uh, the call them civil uh, civil duty politicians. No, but my point was this: in a grounding of deep, more deep-seated cultural norms, what you're supposed to do, mm -hmm. it might be therefore easier to take on, accept the role that your okay, constitution yeah. that says. Be, that may be. Yes. That's what I'm trying to say. Yes, Why good. is it there isn't this big interruption between point. what the constitution says their yeah. role should be? And the way they're conducting themselves, and it seems to me there may be something about this cultural that legacy well be, yes. that actually makes it easier for them yeah. to take on the role that's expected of them. Do you see what I'm trying to say? Yes, I see what you're trying and to say. And also the fact be, uh, that it's not their primary, in or you know, their they all want expected. to fulfill their duty. Yes. Yes, there might yeah, be more yeah, of a duty that's kind of that. I'm just wondering, you know, because yeah. it just it just hit me when I read this. So yeah. I was just wondering, because that I would think is quite distinctive, isn't it, compared yeah. to a lot of other countries? Even, even though... It depends on a lot of countries, smaller even, countries. Th well, that's what I'm saying. Yeah. Even though uh, Swiss don't see themselves as serving, they still serve. Uh, what, yeah. Yeah, they still do what they expect to do. Yeah, yeah maybe one of these We're winding down with this. We have Bill, we have Lee, and Gustavo so far. I wonder, if, and it will depend in part on your sense of that you have and what you can do with it. An alternative lens besides convergence toward constituency would be divergence from party. Mm -hmm. and, and this is an inter... And, and your data, at least your pattern, right. in the paper seems to be interesting from this point of view also mm -hmm. because lower house MPs are, in a sense, recruited to run for the upper house by their parties. And then once they come into the upper house, they become less party loyal. Exactly. That's precisely what we observe. Which is sort of the opposite, again, of the expectation that the parties would select the most party loyal people. Maybe they do, but they put them in the upper house, and then they act like upper house people. They don't have <laughs> actually, If I'm reading your data correctly, they yes. actually diverge more from party loyalty so it is. So in addition to the point that there may be other factors that explain constituency convergence, mm -hmm. there's another way to look at your data, which is party divergence. Yeah. And even when you look at it through that lens, it seemed to me as though you get the same pattern. Is that accurate? I mean, the party divergence is greater as you move from lower to yeah, upper, even you, though it was the party that recruited. You exactly get the, the same pattern. You observe uh, that people, once they are in, as long as they are in the lower house, those who will move to the upper house, they are more party loyal. Mm -hmm. That's consistent with the view that sure. the parties select sure. those who are loyal. That, but, that makes sense. but exactly, that makes complete sense from the incentives of the party. But then, precisely these people, they become less party loyal too, and they uh, converge to being normal representatives in the upper house. So again, they fulfill their they fulfill their role. So we, I would interpret that again as consistent evidence for fulfilling your role. Uh, but I'll work on that. Exactly. Yeah. Do you have data on the losers? In other words, those who lost elections, mm -hmm. and yep. did they lose the election 
because of um, electoral, um, you know, they weren't voting as their constituents wanted. I mean, almost that's true by definition. But, I mean, again, in the U.S., there's, there's huge benefits to being senior. In almost every system, yeah. there's huge benefits to being senior. So kicking out a senior member of, in any political system is usually costly because uh, the young guys aren't on, they're not very powerful, they need to learn the ropes and so on and so forth. So it would be interesting to look at, at the losers, and, and, and particularly uh, Switzerland, like Watts, has been you know, shifting a lot to the right. And to see if, if this left-right split um, is something that's being picked up that guys who were in the median are now losing to, because they, because they don't change their ideology. So the point is, although you get new people coming in voting congruently, it could be that the, re the losers are sticking to their ideology and which would be consistent with Keith Poole's point that people stay with their ideological preferences yeah. over a longer period of time. But then they lose the election because they're not willing yeah. to change and vote uh, to the right as their constituents might we, prefer. We can look at the losers, we partly did it, uh, we can look at the losers as long as the losers remain in the lower house. So as long as they remain in but you could look at the losers in the upper house and how they voted prior to losing. Yes, that's this we can do. Yes. And if they were, you know, once yeah. or two, you know, standard deviation away from the, yeah. the, the mean, then well, they weren't willing to change. Yeah. They were outliers on on voting, mm -hmm. which means they, that the organization wasn't enough to make them change their role. They they had. To they died with their, they got out, voted out of office with their ideological boots on. This we can, they go back this to we their, can do. their bank and yep. Yep. cash in a few gold bricks or whatever. Yeah. Uh, Gustavo. So, uh, David, I was thinking about the, the magnitudes of the effects, no? yeah. compared with more traditional changes in incentives. Mm -hmm. right? like any, any more traditional change in incentives that would affect congruence, what type of magnitude mm -hmm. uh, is going to be the change compared with the magnitude that you are getting there? Because it's like one thing is saying I am moving just so this this would play one percent, and then a change in electoral yeah. rule will play a ninety percent, and another thing is saying hey they are more or less of the same size the magnitudes. No? Yes, that's a good point. I was completely missing from the piece. So yeah, so uh, thank you. So the loser's point is great. Uh, and the magnitude, I can quickly say, so it's uh, a magnitude of seven percentage points to change from, so is the speaker or lower, so it means from going from zero to 100 percent, so it's not so small. It's comparable actually with changing from a center party to a left party. Well, that's, that's interesting. That's a, that's 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 a, that's that's a good thing. point. It's a thing, yeah. That's interesting. Yeah, why not? So so I don't remember you explain that? that? What do you mean by that? Fine. Yeah, so if you change, so if we look at members from the lower house only, so we have done that, uh, and we look whether you are more congruent with the majority of your constituents, whether you are from a left, center, or right party, then the center party people naturally are more congruent. Okay, So if you change party from the center to the left, you also get approximately a seven percentage point jump of becoming less congruent. In this, in this set of, so it's not in this set of referenda that you in that at. set of referenda, yeah. So the left is focusing more on the left, the center is focusing on the majority. Mm -hmm. That's uh, it's so kind of qualitative because you haven't told us whether the left is social democrats or the de linke or Trotsky yeah, uh, or something like that yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, so uh, yeah it's not qualitative of course so it would, it would be it would be in our case uh, something similar to the uh, social democrats yeah but social democrats relatively so 
I mean, there is a clear uh, distinction between different parties uh, based on Romanek's <coughs> course and the Swiss Parti Socialist, Social, Socialist, Socialist Party. They would be uh, relatively on the left, but not, not like the link in Germany. <laughs> so, so, can I have a follow up on this? I think you've got 30 of, seconds. Okay, so yeah. a couple of, of these contrafactual would be very useful. Yeah. It's like, you know, for example, it's like, we. Imagine that you don't have any uh, congruence, also you go back to the what, what percentage of, of, of bills uh, wouldn't pass or change what happened yeah. essentially. Something like that would be very useful yeah. because it gives you an idea of mm -hmm. what the final effect of, 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 of this. Very good, yeah. All right, we are, we're done. Thank you, David. Thank you, Thank you very much. much.